The United States today is bitterly divided between two major political movements. What can we do to solve such a deadly problem? Find the solution in The Legacy of Abraham Lincoln, next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. The American Civil War was called the greatest man-made disaster in American history. And if you look at between 1861 and 1865, you will see that we lost and had 623,000 soldiers killed. 623,000. That is more American soldiers than what we lost in World War I and World War II. That's hard to imagine, but that's what happened. Now today, we hear quite a lot of talk from people who have a lot of knowledge about this country, and we're, they're talking about, well, they think there could be another civil war in America. And there certainly is a lot of bitterness and division. In the November Lincoln Elegy at Gettysburg, Kent Graham wrote, if we Americans can't find Lincoln, we are lost. Now, that may sound a little arrogant, but I tell you, it has a lot of depth. And I want to show you that today, and so I'll just title this, If We Americans Can't Find Lincoln, We Are Lost. That is a quote, but it may sound a little bit arrogant. Let's talk about this and think about this in this program. Lincoln had less than one year of formal education, yet I believe he was the most educated man that we ever had in our presidency. He was rare. Abraham Lincoln was a rare human being, and quite a few people then thought that only he could even win that Civil War. It was, well, terrifying, and the kind of violence we'd never ever even imagined in America. But it happened. Lincoln's part in it was truly rare, and he was one of the most incredibly deep thinkers that we ever had as a president, by far. He read the Bible from cover to cover, and where he was really rare in that case was he believed that Bible. He believed it. That is rare. Look around and just ask people some questions. They don't know much about the Bible, and that's a terrible, terrible waste of our time in, in many ways in him. And yet, the Bible is God in print. So he won the worst war we ever had. Let's look at uh, Matthew 12 and verse 25. Here it says, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Now, Lincoln said that many times and quoted it in his speeches, that a house divided against itself shall not stand. Now, if you look at America and Britain and the Jewish state, those three that are often agreeing on foreign policy, all three of them are bitterly divided in their own country. And I mean, it's bitter in the worst way. That is troubling. Alexis de Tocqueville says this, Any free society founded on liberty, yet without sacred moral code to govern the actions of individuals, cannot stand. Of course, he was talking about this and thinking about that scripture I just read to you. Abraham Lincoln made this comment, and this is before the war began. Here's what he said. In my opinion, the division, they had division in several major issues, and he said, in my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis 
shall have been reached and passed. See, we have to pass through a crisis, and he says, well, why is that? Well, what lessons are we learning? What lessons have we learned today from Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War of 1861 through 1865? A house divided against itself cannot stand. Mark 3 and verse 24 says this and adds a little to it. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now, that's what Lincoln was talking about just before the Civil War. He was talking about these issues and was really alarmed about what was happening in America. I want to read you a proclamation he gave on April 30, 1863, for a nationwide day of fasting and prayer. This great president said, quote, It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation ever has grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. Well, now those are strong words coming from a president of the United States. Can you imagine a president today speaking that way? I, I doubt it. But this is what happened. He says, We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. And here he called for a day of fasting and confessing before our God. In other words, he called upon the people of God to repent. That's what he's talking about here. He wanted us to repent. And we certainly, uh, I think, uh, that message did uh, resonate in many ways. You can look at a lot of statistics, but in the United States alone, uh, once produced 73% of the automobiles. By 1966, the U.S. combined with the U.K. to produce 55%, 44% from the U.S. alone ahead of the rest of the world. There are a lot of statistics in our book on the United States and Britain in prophecy. Surely, Abraham Lincoln did have to uh, understand some of the prophecy of the Bible. Remember, he read it from cover to cover. That's what he did. And we talked about it in some articles that the connection between Americans possessing the fairest portion of the earth is what it says in the Scriptures, Genesis 35, verses 11 and 12. It talks about the greatest single nation ever on this earth, and that ever will be, and the, and the greatest empire ever on this earth, the great British Empire. And how, how did they get all of this wealth? He said, look, it, 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 we didn't create this. This was a gift from God this wonderful wealth that we have. And that's prophesied in those two verses in Genesis 35, verses 11 and 12. Now, the United States and Britain in Prophecy, our book that we offer you, all of our books and booklets are free, and all of our literature is free. If you'd like to read all about that Genesis 35 prophecy, well, you can get all of it written up very well in that book. Lincoln went on to say, though, that if you look on both sides of the parties here, 
and both sides of the issues that he sees lawlessness all over America. And he knew that this was, this was something that was going to be a real problem. Lawlessness. It didn't used to be that way just a few years before. And something began to happen, and it was not a small problem. And he just went on to say that, look, all, if we get into that lawlessness, all that is is suicide. We, we're, we're committing suicide to ourselves. And he went on to talk about the great book that he has, and it's the best gift that God could possibly give you. You can prove that. You really can. And really, most of Abraham Lincoln's basic education was from the Bible. And he knew this was something that we need to understand. His mom died when he was nine years old, and then he had a stepmother, and she read uh, the Bible to him a lot and was more educated than her husband. And so Abraham Lincoln was taught about the Bible, and I mean, it, it was done often by this stepmother, and what a help it was to him in that respect. But he just came to know it. Sandberg wrote, Lincoln read the Bible closely, knew it from cover to cover, was familiar with its stories and its poetry, quoted from it in his talks to juries, in political campaigns, in his speeches, and in his letters. That's what Sandberg tells you. One of his major biographers. People noticed that Lincoln did not attend church regularly at all, and you can read this in several books. That was not because of ignorance or disagreement with the Bible, because it was his knowing the Bible that kept him away from the churches, because he, when he went, they didn't teach from the Bible. That's what was happening. Now, Abraham Lincoln had a profound mind, and he understood the Bible. He believed the Bible. He read the Bible. He knew the Bible, and he knew God in a special way. He didn't attend because he disliked people in any way, but that's, that, that wasn't the reason he didn't go. It was because they just simply weren't teaching out of the Bible, he said. Now, here's another quote in Lincoln's Mentors. Michael Gerhardt writes, quote, Honoring the battle was secondary to Lincoln. He had eyes on the bigger picture, talking about the Gettysburg Address. And what had happened to, at Gettysburg was monumental, but it was only part of the larger civil war which remained unsettled. The burning question in so many people's minds was, why must this horrendous war continue? Why can't we just stop it? Lincoln had to tell them and convince them. So he was well aware of all of those questions being asked and people complaining about it. And, of course, they were having trouble getting enough soldiers to fight, and that was very hard to do as well. But he spoke in the Gettysburg Address for three minutes, less than three minutes, and it certainly became one of the greatest speeches ever given, by far. Let me read you just a little bit of that Gettysburg Address. He began this way, Four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. All men are created equal. This was going back to the Declaration of Independence, July the 4th, 1776. And here he was saying, all men are created equal, and they had slavery at the time. But he was about to change all that, and that's the kind of leader he was. But he, he talked four score and seven years, and he was right, that's right out of the Bible, some of the Psalms and a few other places. He wanted to bring the Bible language into this speech. What they were trying to get across to the world, 
that this was the first time in, in the history of the world that a nation and its representatives had, had gone out and spoken these words ever on this earth, to lead the nation in that way. The first time in the history of the world a nation did that, then declared that all men are created equal. Do we believe that? Well, and just how, how much do we love Abraham Lincoln? I mean, most historians will tell you he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of all our presidents. We are accountable to his, his history, and he's even a witness in many ways against us if we're not careful. I wrote here, without the Declaration there wouldn't even be a Constitution. Uh, several historians will tell you Lincoln understood that the Constitution was built from the foundation of the Declaration. All men are created equal, and they were shouting this to the world. And what a wonderful statement to make to this world. How moving that a nation could do that. How many times do you see anything like that happening? Lincoln was connecting the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution. He was getting into emancipation, and he says, now look, if we don't look to the Bible, we, we don't even know what's right and wrong. We just simply don't know. But anyhow, he, he just went on to say, look, uh, we just have these few years. We may live a little beyond uh, three score and ten. But he says, in just a little while we're going to fly away. We're going to die and just be gone. Well, life is short, and that's pretty obvious to all of us. But I'll tell you something that all of us need to understand, that Lincoln brought God into the, into the Civil War. He brought God into the Civil War. And he won the Civil War. Is that the reason? Well, I think uh, we should think about that and try very hard to answer that. But he went on to say in the Gettysburg Address, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth." People of the people? by the people and for the people. Well, isn't that wonderful we, that this is something that is for the people and not some tyrant ruling over us, but letting the people rule through the, the uh, voting that we have in this nation and in Britain and, and uh, the nation in, in Israel. So this is this is a message that they intended for the whole world, and they, they wanted to be an example to the whole world, and that is the reason why God chose Israel to be an example to the world. And they, well, I'm afraid we failed that because we are a part of Israel. I certainly do believe that. Again, in Thanksgiving, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln made a proclamation of prayer and fasting to express repentance towards God for the many national sins that caused the war. These national sins caused the war. And he's telling them to repent of those sins. Now that, that's a rare speech, isn't it? And a rare subject to get into. If you look at the second inaugural, it was like a sermon. It was just, and he quoted the scriptures quite a few times. He mentioned God 14 times in that second inaugural speech. 
and uh, he quoted scripture four times, invoked prayer four times, and declared slavery a sin. It's a sin, of course, we ought to know that. But nevertheless, when he was talking about the churches, he said, When any church will inscribe over its altar as its sole qualification for membership, the Savior's condensed statement of the substance of both law and gospel, quote, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That church will I join with all my heart. Well, how about that? He just couldn't find them, very many, of, uh, if any. Now, that's, a, that's quite a statement, and that's his quote, a quote from him. See, uh, we hit to have complete freedom, well, you have to have some kind of, uh, let's say, that what they're talking about is some kind of religious character that will make it possible. The Constitution will not work if you don't have people who have real character and faith in God. That it was not designed to, to work for anybody else but faithful people to God. That's, I'm telling you, that He wanted the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And how many people today hate that kind of government? Well, I hope you can just go ahead and read. I don't have time to get into this, but in 2 Timothy 2, God says that He has chosen His soldiers that we are spiritual soldiers and we have to fight, fight, fight for the truth, to keep it where the people do have freedom and an opportunity to really have a wonderful life on this earth. But that's not the case most of the time. He was a soldier, and look what happened. Well, he got killed. But he was ready to fight like all the other soldiers at Gettysburg. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Request Abraham Lincoln, Like a Prophet of God, Where Abraham Lincoln's Greatness Came From, and Lincoln's Fight for True Freedom. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.